Hey, what's going on, Rattler? So we are still here at Nerd, and in this video, we are going to check out some of these amazingly huge, big, beautiful, gigantic, colossal, reticulated pythons. But not only are we going to check them out, but we are going to talk with Mr. Kevin McCurley over here. And so Kevin is not only going to show us some of these really amazing reticulated pythons, but he's going to give us some tips on how to work with these animals, care for these giant snakes, and socialize them and tame them. This is going to be an awesome video, not only for you guys that work with giant snakes, but those of you who are thinking of working with them in the future. I'm Dave Kaufman, and these are my reptile adventures. At Zilla, we are dedicated to the innovation of caging, lighting, and equipment solutions that provide proper husbandry for your pet's long and happy life. To see our entire catalog, visit ZillaRules.com. All right, so you all know Brian Cusco from other videos. He's not going to be in this video because I'm going to hand him my camera, and he is going to be the camera person. So uh, Because Kevin, Dave's videos always do worse when I'm in them. He's, we've learned this. Oh, it's really actually going to hit, hit the bottom now. Right, right. This yeah. is going to be 10 out of 10 for sure. Uh, all right, so Kevin, um, why don't we just kind of, you know, retics. All right, obviously... I'm a reticulated python aficionado, but when you are dealing with big snakes, could be big horses, dogs, anything like that, you need to be successful and be a successful keeper. You need to be able to read their behaviors and each animal is an individual. So you can have like all sorts of different personalities. So it's inherent to that individual. So you get animals more reactive, you get animals that are more really uh, reclined to just being very quiet. So you need to understand those things. And uh, what I do is I read a lot of body language and I teach my animals to trust me. And I'm very methodical, how we do it, how you present yourself. It's all really about reading the body language of the individual snake and realize it and, and kind of trying to anticipate what that snake is gonna do. And I think that's the start of beginning to, you know, successfully work with these snakes. So which one are we gonna take out first? BAM! Oh yeah, look, look at that. that. So which one just did that? Because so when, when Garrett was here filming, and Garrett's somewhere around here, <laughs> you got nailed by a retic. I never get nailed. And it was just, it, what it was that I'm going through drawer after drawer, and the snake was hungry. So it was on the bottom drawer. They actually got it on film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was on the bottom drawer, and I'm like half distracted. So I'm like, ah, I just opened up the drawer, and the snake came out, zapped me, and then let go of me, and I had yes, a nice little do. hematoma. So just be like, like a shark. Just does that little sampling right, bite. That sucking you know, so we remember these guys, these guys are they're ambush hunters and they're also active hunters. So if the animal's sleeping, so it's sitting there sleeping and it's a text moving, all of a sudden I open up the drawer and it's like, ah, oh, food. It goes from sleep mode to a feeding mode. And I do uh, actually we're gonna talk about modes in a second. Modes. Let's go play with the snake. Let's do it. Alright, so when we're keeping large constrictors, first thing is before I ever enter the environment of the snake, I want to be a little bit aware. Right. So uh, I have to eat, treat each animal as an individual and uh, necessary thing is some kind of uh, thing to deter them. Sometimes I'll just use this water dish, roll of paper towels. So when I go into a cage and if the snake is sleeping, I need to wake the snake up. Right. And then I give a chance for the snake's mind to turn on. If the animal's actively wanting to eat, I need to present myself as if I'm not a right. food item. Right. And then all of a sudden there's like a, a switch. The switch goes off and the snake immediately goes into a thinking mode. So reptiles live in modes and there's four modes. Sleep mode, thinking mode is where we want to be, fear mode, where I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going to think, attack. and that's, I'm going right. to do any that. kind of frantic thing. And uh, feed mode. So with reticulated pythons, I don't want to play in the feed mode. I don't want to play in the fear mode. Did I say it twice? But feed mode, feed mode fear, mode, fear mode, mode, fear mode, or sleep mode. Thinking mode, and this is where I want to get it. So it's very easy to get them to that. So okay. if I present myself to this animal, I see where a head is. Right. So there's some things that, that snakes will do. So if I'm watching her and she's a little bit interested in food, if she doesn't come just suddenly forward where you're at, they'll do this little creeping thing. So what I want to do here, good rule of thumb, take my, my tool. Big retail keepers or good, you know, boy keepers of larger snakes, 
they use their implements. So what I do is I come over to her. So she right now, this is it. I, she's doing this little creep on me right now. Right. She's like, oh, you're gonna feed me? So what I'm gonna do, I put this, I touch her. She's still not down. That's pretty much about it. So it's basically telling the snake, you're not getting fed, you're getting held. Yes. So yep. then I'll come over here and uh, she really is on point. Uh, another thing, so there's a long tongue flick. Long tongue flick means, okay, I'm thinking. Right. Very means there's not a lot of stress going on. She right now is reacting. Your camera is auto-focusing over and over again. Reptiles are picking that up and Absolutely. it causes them great stress. One thing you don't want to do, if I go and enter this animal's cage and she is holding the ground, aimed at me, bad. Do not enter that animal's cage. What do you do? Interrupt. Interrupt. Touch. And we're good. So they're highly intelligent species. So they recognize their keepers. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have any kind of relationship with them, they uh, recognize you. And uh, there are certain people that they will really be comfortable with. And there's other people that maybe they've had a bad experience and they don't like. Absolutely. So, but a highly intelligent boy. It's like, these things are a big challenge to keep. So now when I take her out, I like to manage the first third of the body, okay. always. If I grab her down the latter part of her body, what that can do is that can elicit a, a fear response. So what I'll do, I'll just take her out entirely. And remember one thing, even though an animal's big like this, they're fragile because right. they're all spine. And if I want to enjoy an animal like this, I kind of slow her down. Now she's very long tongue flicks. Everything is really good. This snake is giving me A1, like just behaviors. Absolutely. Very, very sweet, very um, whatever. So another thing is, when you're handling big snakes, if you act erratic and you don't flow, everything you, you do has to be, you commit to whatever you do. Absolutely. If you're doing all this jittery and nervousness, you're basically, uh, you're acting in an erratic fashion. These animals are picking up mm -hmm. on things. So I'm very methodical and just very casual and flow. I don't act like the animal's ever gonna bite me. Right. And that's like one of my little things. I always tell people when I handle reptiles, I act like it's never gonna bite me. And what that causes me to do, it just causes me to be settled. And I'm generally reacting to the behaviors of the animal. So if you do not understand snakes, and I pretty much understand these guys pretty well, and I'm reading a lot into it, but if I see a lot of snake keepers that interact with snakes, and I literally feel like they don't even understand. Well, I think that a lot of people out there buy snakes like this, knowing that they're going to get big for the shock value of it, but then are almost afraid of the snake when it gets to this size. Yeah, so uh, basically, I always say that they're not coffee mugs. So they look a certain way, but each of them has its own little, you know, personality right. aspects. If I take a snake that's... Uh, that's more apt to bite and react and shoot around and do all these things. It's doing that because it's fearful. That's what it is. Snakes are not mean. They don't have that capacity where they're just like, I want to hurt you. It's just not built into them, mm -hmm. but they're incredibly fearful. So they're reactive. And that basically means I kind of can't think right now. I'm so scared and I'm so freaked out by that flight or fight is. Kicking yes. In and, so, and right. you, and basically what I want to do is I want to, reinforce the positives and I have this whole thing I call about building threads and it's applicable to big snakes or any kind of reptile that you want to interact with that is often very reactive right and I do it very much with uh, monitor lizards and when you have short episodes and an episode could literally be 30 seconds right but where you have an interaction with that animal you do something you don't cause that animal to go into a flight mode it's where you keep it in thinking mode, you go into its environment, maybe just touch it a little bit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you leave and the snake's like, okay, that person was interacting with me, but nothing bad happened. Exactly. And, and they're going to remember that. And it's more important to manage these little micro 
threads than just having this big half hour interaction where I might go into the cage and it's good for the first three minutes. Then all of a sudden the snake is like, oh my God, I, I, you know, I'm scared or whatever. Mm -hmm. So then what you do is you're creating a negative. So I'd rather build the thread because remember threads collectively make a rope. Right. And that's what we do. Right. So if you want to buy a big retic and you want to work with a big, you know, snake like this, is it, I would think that it's a good idea before you buy that cute little baby snake that's manageable to do some kind of mentorship with somebody that already has these kinds or, of snakes so that you can work they, with them and learn from them. And So nowadays there's a really, there's a lot of good content, certainly New England Reptile Sugars, my content on, I go over this over and over yeah, again. Yeah. I compare Burmese pythons to reticulated pythons. I go through different things. What's the best snake for you? And I go through that. The thing is you have to get credible information mm -hmm. and you need to feed off of somebody else's true intuition that actually has a really good handle on what they're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. And uh, generally, you know, uh, newbies or internet warriors of two years, that, that experience might not be essentially worthless right. because they'll put out bad information and they'll confuse you. And I keep big snakes like this for only one reason, because I am always in awe of them and I admire them. I don't keep them because I want to have a big, crazy predator. I don't even like the fact that they even eat other animals. Mm. If, if I had my way, they'd eat, you know, lettuce or something right, like that. Right. But it just happens to be the, the reality of it. But they're just big, beautiful animal that can definitely be part of your family. Absolutely. Well, and not only that, but the wild caught, not only do they go through so much stress from being caught and putting up you know, a box and being shipped across the they associate humans oh, yes, with, all with, with a lot of, you know, animosity. Yes. So And uh, so basically those live ones, they're collected through the skin trade. Right. That's all it right. is. So the skin trade So they were treated like Oh the worst. You know, I mean the fact that they even didn't get skinned right. is amazing. Absolutely. Alright, so obviously this is a very well behaved snake. It's a snake that you know, it's a snake that knows you. What about a giant snake that is yep. a handful? So this is uh, one, if anybody's seen the video where Gianni is right here, right. parked in front of this cage right. with this animal. And um, he made a couple mistakes. And it's bound to happen. We, sure. all, we all make mistakes. But he made some mistakes because of, you know, it, it takes potentially years and years and years to understand things if you get it at all. Right. So one thing I'm doing here, so I'm towering over it. But another thing, what would be stupid if I go, come here little snakey. And the snake has now got its head turned away from me and I'm still not presenting myself well. This animal is aware of me, I believe, but she's largely asleep. So what I'm gonna do, I gotta wake her up. And one thing they'll often do, from sleeping to awakening is a very quick, mm -hmm. sometimes quick movement. So, right, right. So I it's basically- a, it's a, it's a, They're startled awake. Yes, yeah, and then yeah. sometimes it's an ex excited awake. So what I can do, and I want to keep myself awake. I don't want to put my face in there. Sure. And I don't want to do anything like that. So what I do, there we go. So, yep. Okay, so she, was, yep, she yep. was completely asleep. But this, this tends to be a more uh, nervous snake. And this has a lot to do with the breed. So the platinum gene, which is the heterozygous, for ivory, right, right, right. And ultra ivory, and leucis, and black eyed leucis, they tend to be more reactive. They're large growing snakes, and the reactiveness makes them not as docile as, let's say, we would often consider like a super tiger, mm -hmm, retake, mm -hmm. or a tiger. So I just want to be respectful. Hi, sweetie. So at this point, everything's, but you notice she's not tongue flicking. There's a big difference right there. So right what now, does that tell you when so not defensive. Me? This is very defensive. So she is still like, oh, I don't know what's going on. See, that one was like long tongue right, flicks right. and all that. I can get her tongue flicking, but I have to. Now that comes with a little bit more touch. So come here. I know. Oh, there it goes. So now we've got the tongue flicking. She's very alert. Hi, sweetie. And I can. Resupport, but you see that, look how reactive she is. Right, she chose flight over fight. Yeah, so 
She, so this time of year, something you watch out, so she's going to shoot them out. So yeah. this is a yeah. nice big reactive snake. Yeah, I'll grab the hook over yeah, here. Nice fall. Um, so she didn't try to bite. She didn't do anything. But what she's doing is she's telling us, uh, you woke me up. And one thing's very important. She's full of follicles. At they at the get to this point, her hormones are coming up. Right. And uh, males. If I put a male in the cage, you can get the same reaction as right. by putting the male in the cage. And it's where they're at in a breeding cycle and all this. But this animal has gone into, I'm not thinking, and I'm just going to start reacting. Right, right. And uh, so this would not be an animal that I would like to take out and let a lot of people play sure. with. Sure. We'll pull out another one below it. This animal's actively looking. This one is a sweetheart. Even she's a little, she's a little reactive, uh, but she, yeah, she's good. Coyote yeah. ticks tend to be quite good. Okay, so if I open the cage, so I'm gonna do. So there's a lot of tongue flicking, a lot of curiosity. <clears throat> touch, touch, touch. Everything's good, and it's as simple as that. Now I've met this snake a couple of times. Yeah. And I don't think that these snakes are for everybody. No, absolutely know? not. Nope. Just like a horse isn't for everybody. Absolutely. Just like a Rottweiler, a uh, German Shepherd, all that stuff. You have to find the, the right person in the, in the right fit. And that generally comes out of do, uh, doing your due diligence, right. your expectations of the animals, the management of the animals, the size of some of these animals. Like this would be, this is one of the original golden child. So this is the first female from the first clutch. And we have fed her for, she's probably 12 years old. We fed her very heavily this whole time. Right. So this is a large example. You know, this is a very well-behaved snake. Yes. She's very curious. She's very alert. But she probably has never, like you said, she's probably has never had a negative experience with a person. And therefore, she has absolutely no reason to associate humans with that negative um, you know, response and, and, and so, interaction. So these animals, it's all about trust. Right. If I were to, so if I manage her behind her head, I, if I ever did that, I have to be kind of respectful. So I can, I can sit here and open her mouth and I'm all working around those parameters Absolutely. where I, I'm not like, she's like, all of a sudden resents you. But if I'm not keen and, and treat her like a living right. thing. Right. So if you did that forcefully, it would very, be a yeah, very I do. I think of right, right. So when you grab an animal behind the head, generally, depending on how you are, you can lose a lot of trust, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you can change the behavior of this animal right. greatly. So I just kind of just flow like I'm never worried about her biting me or anything like that. She has no interest. This is, her tongue flicks. Everything is great. She's just curious. She wants to crawl around. You know, we've covered so much information in this video. And, you know, usually I do videos for, well, sometimes, I guess, I do videos for fun. And sometimes I do video just for the purely educational value in them. And that's what this video is. But I am a sucker for pieds. I really yep, want to yep. see the pied before we wrap oh, this yeah. up. There's pieds. So now pied retics, well, they're kind of getting a reputation of, of being brats. very, yeah, brats. That's so, a perfect way so to say I can, it. So I can make pied retics that I have to put extra attention to, mm -hmm. but I can get them so they're social. Right. But... They are more of a hair trigger animal. And why is that with the pieds? Well, it's just like, so it's, it's, it's in the bloodline. So the bloodline, the origination of the bloodline and just the genetics. So you might come in with the genetics of the pie. It might bring in hyper animal or a little more reactive. Because we don't see that with any of the pies. We don't see that with pied ball pythons. We don't see that with pie fill in the blank. There are genes that are linked. There's all sorts of linking of genes where like, you know, if I breed something, it's always going to mm -hmm. bring this other thing because it could be on right. the locust site or linked to another locust site and allelic and all that different stuff. So an animal like this, they uh, tend to be um, bitey and they pee a lot. Yep. And when an animal's peeing uh, and biting, it basically means I'm really untrusting of you. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. very nervous of you. So this animal is awake. She's noticing us and she's looking away from us and she hopes that we're just gonna not acknowledge her. Right. And one thing, I, when I have an animal that's this reproductive, I'm not worried about the food mode. Her hormones are repressing her desire to eat. So what I'm doing is just kinda 
waking her up. As well, she's already awake, but just yeah, kind of yeah. letting her know that something is now going to happen. Basically, I'm seeing long tongue flicks. And if I get her kind of crawling, so what she's going to do? She's going to get really defensive in a minute. And what I do is I just kind of work around it because I know. So there's triggers right now. She's stopped and she's waiting for me to screw up. So what I can do, she's going to want to double down and she's going to want to go where her tail is. So if I don't flash myself in any kind of uh, scary manner, which is, so see right here, I got to touch her. Right. It's very important. If I sneak up on her and suddenly touch her, it's not good. So very gentle. They're very tactile creatures. And she's kind of an explore mode right now. Yeah, but she's a not a trustworthy animal. Absolutely. So that can like turn in a in a minute. Yes. So I'm kind of just working. But you notice how like the same thing. Act like you're not gonna get bit. Right. And I just kind of slow and flow. And when an animal like this is on the ground and it's crawling, I always want to manage the first within that first within third of the body. First third, right? right? And I'm watching the tongue. If she wasn't, she's setting up a little bit against you. If I wasn't watching that tongue coming out, she stopped. And then she did little that little short tongue flick. Mm -hmm. That's one reason why I can tell. Her behavior just changed. She's very aware of you. Right. So what I can do is I can interrupt it. So all I'm doing right now is giving her a chance to think. And this is, this is essentially building threads. Absolutely. I haven't done anything. But I'm kind of I'm kind of just working around the parameters. I didn't freak out. Right. See that like where she just right somebody else would have jerked and that would have that would have set so like off right. I'm just being kind of supportive and letting her think, and then you get to have this wonderful experience with a big snake like this. That when is you, the most amazing retic on the planet thank right you. there. So this is a little moo cow, and this is our our cow retics that we make with. Uh, calico influence it's it's in the genetics and it causes something weird to happen and it causes the genes to leak more so if I'm looking at what the snake is telling me this snake is saying this is wonderful uh, very very curious long tongue flicks it enjoys the event of coming out of the cage um, if I'm stupid I'd be a lot of flashing my face. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that because you want to respect that they have teeth, even though I know an animal like this wouldn't. But I'm going to show you a little trick. If I'm afraid of this animal ever biting me, as it's doing this, I just change where it was without, you see? see Interesting. How it was, see? So what they do is, so I learned this a long time ago when I was dealing with a lot of wild caught snakes that want to bite me. And I didn't want to grab my hunting head, but I still had to take care of them. So what I would do, I would just, so I want to get the head away from me so it's not zeroed in. I'm going to bring its stress down. It's going to have to see my, my eyes. Another thing, so if I was kind of a little bit worried, over my head. And this animal now kind of looks up. It's just, everything's good. And I can bring the stress. And then I can do, I can even look away. Because my eyes are vulnerable. I don't want to get, I wouldn't ever want to get bit in the face. So if I come down, and now I'm going, oh, it's, it's getting towards my arm. There it is. See it? So when you raise your hand like that and get them as high as possible, it also gives them a feeling of comfort Absolute, because absolutely. in the wild they are taking comfort way up in the canopy of the trees. And, and I'm not glaring. I'm not glaring over it. Right. So well, Kevin, thank you so much for showing us this. I, you know, again, I make a lot of fun videos, but every once in a while I've got to throw in one that is full of education and. Man, you know, getting what's in your head out there in the world for everybody to learn from, I think is very important. One thing and that's very important to me is uh, not because I love people. I'm always very clear about this. I love these animals so much. If I can educate you and other keepers and I get you to think maybe a little bit differently or if you would like anything about the way I keep animals or the way I interact with animals, you could then take it and then it helps give you a little bit of a different angle when you're educating people because what I'm interested in is the world loves these animals and they see an importance for them because Absolutely. these animals are vanishing in our lives and every day we're becoming more isolated from nature and I really 
don't like that and I love the animals so I'm kind of like a spokesperson for the animals and these are the stewards of the environment and I want people to admire them so I want to show you the best I can show you of these animals and that's why I love them. So guys, before you go out and buy a really cute baby retic, you know, do as much research as you can and know that that animal is going to be a giant. And if you can, get a mentorship with people that are already working with these giants so that you can learn as much as you can before you buy that cute little baby retic. So anyway, guys, I'm gonna put all of the links for Nerd's YouTube channel in the description below. Go check them out. And guys, I've just released a brand new novel. That link is in the description below. Check that out as well. And as always, Always, thanks for watching and until the next reptile adventure love the planet feed your reptile obsession and rattle on